Hi, I'm Allison Goldwyn, your moderator for the Dawn of an Era of Wellbeing podcast series, informing you that due to unforeseen scheduling challenges, Irvin's interview with Hazel Henderson was recorded independently from hers with Frederick Saw. Yet it's every bit as interesting. Have a listen at the end of today's broadcast and feel inspired. on earth are we? Why in heaven are we here? And how to make sense of this mess of our humanness and perhaps even transcend it. Welcome everyone. From whatever nation state or emotional state you might be in, dawn of an era of well-being is the place to tune in. We're going to deep dive into uplift with insight. And I'm thrilled to welcome always our two formidable hosts, two-time Nobel nominee and founder of the Laszlo Institute. Institute of New Paradigm Research and the Club of Budapest, Professor Irvin Laszlo, and a fourth generation family business entrepreneur who is the founder of ITEA Institute Quantum Leadership Center, Fred Sal. I'd like to start each episode by acknowledging our worldwide audience. Uh, for many of them, this is a very challenging time. I mean, some people are really thriving at this moment, but most people are really going through quite a challenge. And Dawn of an Era of Wellbeing podcast and book hope to offer real comfort to the global community. We encourage you to not only read the book and hear the podcasts, but to almost feel them, to start awakening your senses to different ways of perceiving beyond just our eyes, just our ears, because this is the space that Irvin and Fred refer to as consciousness, and that's going to be our comfort zone in the long term. So before I introduce today's illustrious guest, Hazel Henderson, let's begin with a brief recap, if you will, about two words that are fast filtering into the global zeitgeist. Fred, what do we mean, for those people that are not familiar or who are just tuning in, what do we mean by consciousness and what do we mean by a new paradigm? And because there are two additional words that are very important that are becoming part of the global vernacular, and you refer to them in in the book, and we need to distinguish the difference between them, well-being and wellness. You can start out, Fred, by sharing your uh, perceptions and thoughts about these words, these very important words. We'd appreciate it. Well, I think there's uh, so many ways, some technical and others, about consciousness. But we have a direct experience of consciousness because um, we don't exist without consciousness. If you're not conscious, how do you know you exist? And so consciousness is a thing is aware, being aware. But in the new paradigm of consciousness, the consciousness become by itself the creator. Because as consciousness meets energy, matter is created. It is a perception of form by clustering of energy to give the appearance of form. But actually it is just information. Like we see in metaverse. They're just information make up of what appear to be formed. And so from a quantum scientist perspective, everything has a unified field of this consciousness. And from this consciousness field comes this evolutionary energy that comes out uh, from the consciousness. And at the same time, an and evolutionary attractor back into the consciousness, like a reaching up an arm, moving out, and creating or materialistic uh, appearances. Mm-hmm. And so um, there, of course, being an energy, it has to abide by the law of principle of energy. So everything is oscillating. Everything uh, is creating in this energetic essence, and it has a, a certain structure in forming it, and there's a mathematical model, and it's, it's kind of a spiraling movement. And every moment, it's calibrated to balance, because this foundation is is holistic. Mm. And so, human being uh, is the most conscious uh, being 
uh, on earth. Um, so we have human and a being. We don't have dog being or cat being, but a human being because we're really kind of a very special animal. Um, except oftentimes we're not being. We're not well. We don't know our nature and why we're here. The existential question. Who am I? Where did I come from? What I'm doing here? Where I'm going? And the quantum paradigm gives the answer to this existential questions and give rise to a contemplation of what human being is supposed to be. What is human and how do they be human? And so this well-being is always mean that you are well when you're being. But in the quantum paradigm, everything is systemic in its material form. So it is only well when the whole system is well. And the whole system is all material form, which means that the universe is life, earth is life, mountain, river, sea, everything is life. Even rock has consciousness. And this life system has to be well before all is well, because everything is within that system. Mm-hmm. And not be well until all is well. And now we have all is not well. Everything is not being. And one of the best way of understanding not being is when you're stressed out. When you're stressed out, you're not being. And so earth is not stressed, is stressed out, they're not being, and then they start dying. Society is not being, so they're dying. It's not really natural. We're not Cheerful. Natural cheerfulness is being. So we always said, uh, you know, uh, truth, uh, goodness and beauty. When that's the whole being. Being naturally who we are. And we don't know who we are. And so we cannot be. And this ignorance and creation of reality created all the stress throughout the whole system. And so we have to correct it to find out and be. Because when you're being, you're natural and you're not stressed. So to be ourselves is when we are in a natural state. But we need to find out who we are. <laughs> now, Indeed. true self. <laughs> Indeed. And, and we are doing just that, uh, little by little. Uh, but it is a big, big subject and a very important one that's really beautifully said. And I think on that delicious note, uh, I'm going to now introduce today's special guest and contributor to the book, Hazel Henderson. So listen to this. She's the founder of Ethical Markets Media. She is a world-renowned futurist, evolutionary economist, worldwide syndicated columnist, author of award-winning Ethical Markets, Growing the Green Economy, and eight other books. Her articles have appeared in over 250 journals, including Harvard Business Review, New York Times, Christian Science Monitor, as well as journals in Japan, Venezuela, China, France, and Australia. Uh, Hazel may be also in the in the cosmos and other galaxies, but <laughs> we'll see about that later. Um, and since becoming a full-time media executive in 2004, Hazel has stepped down for many of her board memberships, but she is a fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science and the World Business Academy, and she's also an honorary member of the Club of Budapest. That is one big mouthful. Hazel, the world is hungry for hope. Let's talk about cake and how to make our lives more tasty, more delicious by 2050. So, first of all, hello, Hazel. Nice hello, to have you. Hello, Nora. Thank you so much. And um, I'm Nora is here, but I'm Allison. But don't worry, we're all one. So in a sense, oh, everybody, yes. Well, yes. <laughs> we are all one, Hazel. <laughs> <laughs> it's no problem. That's the first test of proof that we're all one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you, Allison. I'm sorry. That's oh, so okay. Right. Well, uh, the first thing I, I want to say um, is <laughs> that we humans. Um, are a mammalian species along with uh, hundreds of thousands of other mammalian species on a planet 
which um, is totally powered by the free photons that come from our mother star, the sun. And we have fallen into um, a trap of what I call anthropocentrism. And that is sort of a form of narcissism. Mm. Where we really think, uh, just as the way they did in the old times, they thought that the earth revolved around the sun. Right now, uh, we humans are in a state of hubris where we actually think the planet revolves around us. <laughs> where, <laughs> well, the, the truth of the matter is that mm. the planet is in charge. And the planet will remain in charge as long as we get those free photons every day. When the sun finally dies, uh, the planet will die, along with us and all the other species. So um, my work um, is working back from the actual planetary reality. And today, particularly um, highlighted by the COVID uh, virus, we have uh, begun to realize that the planet is teaching us directly. Mm -hmm. And it's saying, look, you have all of the wrong paradigms in economics. You have all of the wrong scientific paradigms because they're all based on ego and uh, that, that this narcissism, that we're all in charge, whereas the first thing you have to understand is we're not in charge. Mm. And uh, so this is one way um, that you can relax. You know, uh, all of the stress is about thinking that we're in charge. Oh, my God, we've got to manage the planet. So we are in a situation now. We are going to Glasgow next week uh, for COP26, and the uh, International Scientific Group, IPCC, uh, tells us we now have nine years to turn the thing around. Um, uh, because if we continue uh, pouring fossil fuel uh, CO2 emissions into the uh, atmosphere, um, we will go beyond 1.2 degrees centigrade of warming. And we know very well that we, uh, uh, we're, we're right now at 1.1 centigrade of warming. And, uh, this has produced fires, floods, um, hur very much stronger hurricanes, droughts, um, and all happening, uh, very quickly and surprisingly. Like, look at what happened to California this week. They have been in uh, an extraordinary period of drought, you know, 50 years of drought, such that the Colorado River um, no longer flows to the sea. And the Colorado River, which um, provides all the water supply for California, um, is going to cease to do that um, in a few years. And as Lake Mead and Lake Powell uh, go down further, you know, there's a huge bathtub ring around those two lakes. Um, they will no longer be able to generate electricity through um, the, uh, you know, th through the hydroelectric, uh, the whole purpose of the dams. So, so this is a reality check. And the planet is also teaching us um, that uh, if we keep on destroying other species' habitats, um, we are going to have one zoonotic disease after another. So how it doesn't matter how COVID-19 uh, came to be, whether it was from bats or whatever, um, there will be the next one and the next one and the next one. Because we are driving animals out of their habitats into our Space. In other words, we have invaded their space, and um, so we will catch more and more um, of these zoonotic uh, diseases. So, in a sense, um, that's where I begin. And there are, uh, you know, it's uh, it's such an interesting thing because 
Um, this hubris and um, ego tripping that's going on right now is that everybody is running around saying, oh, we have to save the planet. Oh, my God, we have to save the planet. Um, the planet is going to be fine. It's we are going to, f- to join the sixth next great extinction. We are extincting millions of other species um, every year now. We're in the sixth great extinction through our own actions. And um, if we don't turn around in nine years, and it only means changing our consciousness. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, it's really a big I, little word. <laughs> here's the thing, that consciousness changes in an instant and I've seen this all my life, you know, because I've been debating economists and scientists, you know, and um, they um, have this view um, that um, everything is going to go on being extrapolated from where we are. And they can't uh, understand what Irvin Laszlo understands. And that is the magic of consciousness. That, that we create the world um, uh, through our thoughts. And right now, we've created a terrible mess um, of self-inflicted harm. And it's a terrible way for us to have to learn, but the planet has realized, okay, um, that this species is going to have to learn because otherwise they're not fit. You know, and another species will pick up, life will go on, you know, and some other species will pick up the ball and uh, create the next conscious life form. So, uh, so uh, this is a, okay, um, this is a harsh lesson, but it, uh, to me, it's the beginning of the wisdom of understanding the power of consciousness. And <laughs> see, and so what I've done with most of my books um, is to try to engage um, mostly with economists. And why did I choose to engage with economists all the time? Well, it's because their macro statistics, which are very, very narrow and almost unconscious, I have to say, because <laughs> they're all built on the price system. See, and the price system uh, is a function of human ignorance because it's always backing into the future, looking through the, the mirror, uh, rear view mirror. Price is always historic. Mm-hmm. And we allow this thing, which is almost a Freudian slip, the term externalities. So accountants are allowed to, quote, really to cook the books. And so in all of the balance sheets of governments and agencies and all of the corporations, um, we have this balance sheet um, which externalizes from the balance sheet all of the social and environmental costs that we're inflicting on the planet to make us feel good. And so we can declare at the end of the year a thing we call profit. Um, And so uh, we're hypnotized at the moment by money. And I always uh, love that Paul Simon uh, song, you know, and the people bowed and prayed to the neon God they made. Right now, our consciousness is connected with the neon God of money. And so my whole, uh, I mean, in this lifetime, my whole, this particular, why did I want to incarnate at this particular point? <laughs> what if people are asking this question? Yeah, right now, yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah. and, and basically, um, is to try and correct this colossal error. And it's not to say that money and markets aren't wonderful inventions. And humans have been using them for thousands of years. And uh, there are lots of wonderful economic studies that show you that uh, so-called primitive people, i.e. indigenous people all over the world, have been using money and markets for centuries, millennia. 
Uh, for example, um, in the, the Polynesian islands, uh, all of these different islanders with different value systems, different levels of consciousness about what they valued, um, would paddle their canoes thousands of miles between each of these islands, and they would exchange um, uh, things that they relatively valued, which were different. And the money they used was shells. And all over North America, um, Native Americans have traded over the entire continent using wampum and um, exchanging feathers and uh, all kinds of things that they valued. And, uh, and their whole uh, uh, system, their economic system, um, was based on competing for who could be the big shot who gave away the most, the potlatch value system. And one of my most prized possessions is a potlatch bowl, which uh, these groups uh, in British Columbia um, carved for me and dedicated to me uh, because I have been talking about the love economies. And that's the third layer down in my birthday cake. And that, and, and that is the traditional um, societies that human beings have had for thousands of years before the Industrial Revolution, which is only, you know, less than 300 years old. And for all those thousands of years, the uh, value system, which you know well, is the golden rule. Human beings uh, understood systemically uh, their mutuality and that do as you would be done by. Very simple. And it came from Confucius, from Jesus, from Mohammed, uh, every religious tradition. If, if you go on Wikipedia, you'll find 50 pages on the roots of the golden rule. And when the Industrial Revolution got going, and we had these technological tools that would increase the production of material goods you could drop on your foot, you know, which was the thing human beings really love, material goods. You know, we're very good at creating them. You know, we, um, out of our consciousness, we create skyscrapers. They start, they start as a blueprint. They start in the consciousness of an architect. And then they become a blueprint. And before you know it, there is a skyscraper. <laughs> so exactly. You... It's fascinating. But Hazel, this is, this is so important what you're saying. But now imagine this. Thousands of years of back history of the golden rule that was operative and functioning. And yet in a couple of hundred years, the Industrial Revolution you know, 100 years, it's basically wiped it out. What does that say about the state of the human condition? I mean, are we high, hardwired, if you will, for that which is looking for the icing on the cake, the, the very, very top layer? How do we reconcile that? What's your thought on that? Because this is well, fascinating. That came, in, that came in with the Industrial okay. Revolution, really this idea of competing about material goods. That came in as we got really good at that. And so um, so both uh, money and markets um, became the most obvious way to kind of measure um, these material goods. And, and so that was how uh, markets and money became actually weaponized as tools of power. They weren't, they were not tools of power before. They were merely means of exchange. And so, uh, so basically that, uh, three layer cake of mine, mm -hmm. my gosh, you know, 
uh, that book of mine, Politics of the Solar Age, <laughs> is in 800 libraries around the world now. And honestly, I get a request from all these different languages to use that cake, the cake diagram. Because... Let's make sure that, that our, our audience knows what those layers are just to... Oh, yes, yes. Well, yeah. if, I had, if I'd thought about this, I could have, you know, given you a visual. But basically... Or a podcast. So, yeah. so we're going to... Oh, that's right. It wouldn't have worked, right. So yeah. the three-layer cake uh, with icing on the top yeah. is uh, a way of modeling the productive system of societies today. And the top two layers, um, there's the private sector, which is the icing on the cake. We all love to do this individualism thing, you know, start companies, and, you know, that's what I like to do. But they rest on taxpayer-supported collective public goods that we have to provide as the underpinning. You have to have schools and roads and hospitals and uh, airports and, you know, all of that stuff. Otherwise, uh, none of it would work. You couldn't do all these fun things unless you had the infrastructure. And the discussion today in the U.S. Um, yeah, about the whole idea that if we are going to go forward, um, we have to now create a new layer of infrastructure, which most European countries already have, which is the care sector. Mm-hmm. We can no longer rely on women doing this as volunteers. See, women have doing have been doing this for thousands of years, um, taking care, raising the children, taking care of the household, like my mother used to do, serving on the Meals on Wheels, you know, and the Well Baby Clinic and all those things she used to do in the village, you know. And um, we have forgotten in the U.S. in our hyper-individualism and this narcissistic phrase, uh, phase that we're in, um, we haven't acknowledged that the entire thing rests on the older voluntary unpaid work of the love economy, which is still based on the golden rule that community is what counts and our mutuality and uh, and so what happened was that we're beginning to destroy it. Uh, in most countries, the love economy, which is the third layer down of the cake, uh, you see these, the two layers at the bottom are the love economy and nature's productivity. But economists don't know anything about that. So they uh, calculate um, all of our macro statistics from GDP to all of the macro statistics that are driving us over the cliff Mm. are in the top two layers. Um, And the two bottom layers are invisible to economists. They're not in the textbooks. They're not in the models. And um, and so now what's happening um, is we're realizing, oh, my gosh, you know, um, guess what? We do have to create, you know, a taxpayer layer of, uh, of infrastructure, as they do in most European societies where you have um, uh, a full, fully paid health care as a right, um, you have pretty much free education as a right. Um, you have a child, you have, uh, you know, a, a subsidized child care so that people, women can afford to go out and work right now. Four million women in the U.S. had to stay home. Uh, and leave their jobs because there's nobody to look after the kids. They couldn't couldn't afford the child care even if it was available. But most of the little child care companies went bust. See, in the in the in the COVID, so we suddenly realized, oh my God, that economic model based on the top two layers, just the icing and the uh, infrastructure layers, uh, we have to start looking at how valuable the love economy layer is and uh, how valuable nature is, uh, because otherwise we'll keep on destroying uh, other species. And so the big debate that's going on now in economics, is can we turn all of those two lower layers that we forgot 
Mm-hmm. Can we get those into the price system? And I'm saying, no, 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 that's completely the wrong thing. Uh, these two lower layers have an alternative value system that is not based on money and not based on power and competition. It's based on the golden rule. And it's still bigger in every society. The golden rule, a love economy, is bigger than the the official money-measured GDP economy. And the best example of that is in African countries, where um, Western economists will look at these African countries and they'll say, oh, they're poor. And they are only looking at the 15% of those societies that have adopted the the money measures. And for most of them, uh, everything is still done as mutual aid and barter and exchange, uh, you know, and it is uh, what economists call the informal economy. And so the big debate that, that I'm having now and really very much enjoying is, okay, we have to know when money and markets are wonderful tools and are the most appropriate to apply to what we want to do. And then we have to also know we're applying money and markets to domains where they don't belong, like, you know, the golden rule domains, we just create the most horrible market failures, and that's climate change, the healthcare system. I just have an article coming out next week called Fixing the U.S. Healthcare Disaster. And the reason the U.S. healthcare has um, performed so disastrously, almost the worst in the world, on deaths from the COVID virus um, is because we assume that in this country uh, that healthcare can be a market, and it can't. It never can be a market. And the reason I say that is because all of those economists, you know, who worship Adam Smith, you know, the wealth of nations and all this, he said very clearly that you couldn't have a market unless these conditions were met, that the buyers and sellers would meet each other in the marketplace with equal power and equal information and did not uh, inflict any harm on other innocent bystanders. And so you look at the U.S. healthcare care system um, and you see that the buyers are the patients, and they have almost no power and almost no information. And the sellers, the, the, the practitioners, um, the providers, the insurance companies, they have all the power and all the information. <laughs> and so, uh, and so that's why we have a healthcare system twice as expensive. 18% of our GDP now is on healthcare than all the other OECD countries in Europe. Uh, who get better outcomes at half the cost because they understood that healthcare is in the, um, is, is basically, um, a right, uh, that we must mutually take care of each other's health. And what we are realizing now is that that lesson that the planet is teaching us again is with COVID-19, that until all of us are vaccinated, all over the world, none of us are safe. You can't create a little safe haven. Uh, yes. You're going to have a variant will come in, like the Delta came in from mm-hmm. India, and we're going to have another one until we until we start cooperating. So the the issue really is when our markets cooperate, co- competitive markets and using the prices and when they are appropriate and when you must use the cooperation and the innovation uh, to create the public goods uh, and the collective strategies that uh, protect us all. 
Okay, this is really big stuff we're dealing with here. And Fred, coming from the East, you know, and Hazel has described the dynamics very, very clearly, not just about the U.S. Um, poll, but a, a, really a worldwide dynamic. I know that there are areas in the world that are much less oriented towards that icing on the cake. But Fred, coming from the Eastern uh, cultures, do you feel that uh, it is possible to swing that pendulum back? Do you feel that there is an inclination, a desire, a hunger for uh, people to move away from that icing, that, that sugar high that we're getting? Because it's almost like a gravitational pull, isn't it? I mean, there is something. That, yeah. Yes, and it's very, it's very seductive when you're in the direct line of that pull of that sugar high. So, F Fred, what do you think in terms of the Asian cultures? Is there a leaning I think now? she's frozen, yeah. Okay, I can say not so much Asian culture, because they are very much westernized nowadays, but I can share with you what I see happening in China, especially over the last 40 plus year. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you hear? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can hear you. Right. Hazel can hear you. So, first of all, uh, despite communism and all the things, the management system of China is still following the the one the time of the Qing Dynasty when China is, is set, and that system is called democratic consultative process centralized decision-making. Mm -hmm. Despite all the movement, every dynasty proposed their own uh, thing, some are Taoism, some are Buddhism, but everybody has Confucianism at its base because it's the foundation uh, of ethical system in China. There are also a lot of thoughts, but mainly these two, Taoism or Buddhism depending on the emperor. And with that worldview, it manages. Now, we have to understand we came from a religious um, uh, uh, era that moved into uh, renaissance of revolution of art and then science and then age of enlightenment. And then it comes materialism, uh, comes science, comes utilitarianism. Then it comes the ism era comes, right? Capitalism, the communism, the ism era as a world <laughs> taking over, which is the, the politics and the economic structure, right? The ism took over. And of course, within the ism, things get lost. So like uh, capitalism, they forgot a, a theory of the moral sentiments, that we are actually moral people. They only think self-interest. So maximize, show this value, free the market. There was a big thing with the Friedman in the University of Chicago. I watched this whole process together with the market economy and stuff like that. Now, you have to understand fundamentally in running two systems. Although everybody is moving to socialism because communism can't survive, so they're moving to socialism and they are moving to market economy. And so is the West moving to socialism. So you can see it's a cross nature of capitalism moving towards the other direction and communism. The isms are <laughs> hybrids, mm -hmm. right? So look, we look at the plan and the market economy in America is not that extreme. And probably New Zealand on one hand and, and North Korea on the other extreme of this ism Spanned. Mm -hmm. Now that China has an entire different system, the Chinese manage a concept of economics based on stability. Mm -hmm. right. They would only get fast growth if you have stability. And so it's like riding a bike. They have to manage the stability to get the speed. So you see that managed very differently. And then they understand the risk of this casino economy of the capitalistic market, the capital markets. 
And they understanding the U.S. dollar phenomenon, but they have to still keep printing to play the game. But their money never left China. <laughs> it's still in <laughs> So when it comes to the circulation, our work, and in fact, was favored to China because 200 million that used to go overseas are now developing China economy, mm. are moving overseas. And then with, oh, the U.S.-China thing, we have to look at localization. Everybody's looking at localization because of the, the supply chain disruptor. China, with this U.S.-China relationship, really pushed the economy. And now you see that China is really booming because of the COVID. So first of all, they managed to cap the market. They do not allow gambling. Because everybody says bloody murder. You cannot stop trading for two months. Yes, I can stop you from trading for two months. <laughs> Gamble. Then they said, all right, that's great. I have high PE, I have good. The money is channeling to business, but business is not good. I need to manage the business. And so they said, oh, okay, you can't steal the data and sell it to people. I get you. So Hansen, DD, you can't sell data. And then there's education, a lot of profit here because Asian and Chinese really are heavy on education. A lot of hearing in, in, in education. Mm-hmm. Just, you can't profit here. In fact, you can't operate that business. I know what you're doing. It's not good. The market economy is capitalizing on the weakness of humans. Right. The love market is all about that. Mm-hmm. It was one's ego. And people's desire to endless consume is not good. So now China with this new uh, worldview and direction in this new era, it was announced in 2017 in the United Nations about this new direction mm-hmm. of how much quality. Then in 2018, they declare a new worldview for China. And the new worldview of China is one of revitalizing of ancient Chinese worldview. And that worldview says, for the reality and the need of the common destiny of humanity, we move to this worldview of oneness. Mm. Oneness of universe and self. We move to this worldview of harmony and collaboration among nations of celebrating diversity, Mm -hmm. of achieving goodness as morality. Now, that's a very traditional, the Mm -hmm. goodness is and it's holism. The more holistic you are in the system, and it is based on the great learning book of China. So what basically it says, Confucianism comes back. Mm -hmm. Great what? Based on this Chinese characteristic, Socialistic market economy. Now, there's a difference between individualistic I, the we in the I, and the I in the we. <laughs> we in the I is the we, my family, my country. Mm-hmm. One way of thinking about it. Mm-hmm. Right. Or I, individuality only exists in collectivism. I do not exist outside of the system. So I belong to the system. Mm-hmm. That difference in the approach. The Western is my family, my thing, my, my, my. Now, I don't want to criticize, but you look at that position of a vision of the future of China and what they're doing and their economy, all the problem you're saying with all these, what do you call it, uh, new, Economy based on surveillance. Mm-hmm. The Chinese take care of because they're the only one allowed to survey. Nobody can do surveillance, and certainly not to sell data to other people. That is mm-hmm. not ethical, and they won't allow that. Mm-hmm. And now to business, just recently after the COVID, they said we want to go through this market economy, the new third way of distribution of wealth so that we can prosper together. 
So everybody's like really worried. And they don't understand. They thought there would be more taxes. Mm-hmm. So the Chinese comes with like 10 cents and Alibaba just donating money. He said, no, 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 no. Mm-hmm. I don't want money. I want you to your heart. I want to change your mind. And then the third uh, distribution is by allowing freedom. Mm-hmm. Second distribution is by not allowing freedom. So yeah. first, opening the market. The second is controlling it while you're opening the market. And the third distribution, he says, because China is now beyond property, but it's still not equitable. I want you to do it on your own will because you have moral sentiments. I want you to behave as businessmen, a very important role of love mm. and kindness. I want business to do it, to help everybody. Mm-hmm. And the Chinese are very dedicated to market economy. They see mm-hmm. that this way to do, this is called the third wave of the distribution. They know very well taxing somebody like robbing them and give it to the poor, like robbing them, doesn't mm-hmm. because it keeps motivation on both sides. You tax them, you have no motivation to create. You give it to them, they have no motivation to work. So they want this new systemic flow that's based on goodness, which is expression of love, mm-hmm. and which they have to go back for really major way of building a country by building this new revitalization of the Chinese culture, traditional this Chinese exciting. culture. For, for this is where they're going. Yeah. This is so exciting. And yet I can just hear in the background certain factions of the society saying, because we know that there is also East-West tensions, and that has been, it's been driven also by media, but we also know that China has, um, a, 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 like the U.S. in certain senses, a, a grand appetite, and they are building what we'll call the new Silk Route, but the trade route throughout Europe and really throughout the world. So how how both of you perhaps can address this. How can we help people to understand that there really isn't a dissension because people are, are hearing one thing, but they're seeing another. And if they see a great, a great nation like China, much like a great nation that has been the U.S. saying, OK, now we will show you the new way. And even if it's a beautiful way, aren't people going to react? Aren't they going to have a resistance because we're still ingrained in that competitive uh, model as as a human being. It's been so entrenched for so long. Can you both address that dynamic, how we can overcome that? Step yeah, by step? I would love to. Yes, Alison. Yeah. I, I would love to jump in on that. And okay. I have to say, I agree with everything my friend just stated. <laughs> <laughs> yes. it's, really and, uh, it's really very interesting. I didn't expect to get into this kind of discussion. But I wrote an article which is circulating right now among um, Wall Streeters, mostly Wall Streeters. <laughs> and it's called um, ESG, which is, means Environment, Social, Society and Governance, which is the way we are trying to steer capitalism, you know, toward the, quote, stakeholder model. So mm-hmm. my article is called ESG, Stakeholder Capitalism and uh-huh. China's Common Prosperity. And I point out, I've been to China many, many times, mostly at the invitation of the state council. And I've given many, many lectures, and I've learned so much from my Chinese colleagues about social indicators. Because I was looking for indicators beyond the price system. And, oh, my gosh, all of these social indicators. So um, that's been my experience uh, in China. I haven't been there lately. Still have many, many friends there in many of the institutes. Mm-hmm. And, um, basically I started off by saying, um, okay, these are the world's two new superpowers. By a money-based GDP, uh, standards, the U.S. economy is slightly bigger 
And by what we call purchasing power parity, PPP, China is bigger. China is the largest economy in the world. So we, are, we now are entering this geopolitical stage in the 21st century where we have these two almost co-superpowers. Yes, and it's very interesting. What I look at in this article is the way their different value systems are trying to control markets. And I pointed out that um, trying to control the Wall Street high rollers, um, where I use an example, um, where a whole bunch of these Wall Street high rollers have given millions and millions of dollars to the election campaign of uh, what I think is a very bad Republican governor, the governor of my state, Ron DeSantis. And uh, he wants to be the new Trump and to take over the Republican Party, which has completely lost its way. Um, it's become totally narcissistic, totally into money and power, you know, and all of that. Mm -hmm. So they're not interested in governing. Um, they're not interested in the common good. The, all it is is about power. How do we assemble power? And we're now learning um, a lot more every day about uh, January 6th that it wasn't just a one-off thing that sort of happened. It, it was planned with an enormous amount of money behind it, mm -hmm. Republican money behind it. And the, the group at the Willard Hotel, um, right after the election, began planning how they were going to um, overturn the result of the election and prevent a thing that's never happened in this country before, the peaceful transition of power. And so our democracy is in a very fragile state right now. Um, and so the media um, are, are, are looking at all of the conflicts and all the rest of it. But I point out in the rest of my article, um, all of the ways that uh, China and its common prosperity approach, where you tell Jack Ma, and uh, no, you're not going to be able to bring um, public. Sorry about that. And uh, um, the guy who um, runs, uh, I think his name is Hui, who um, runs Evergrande, second richest man in China. No, um, that housing is for living in, not for speculating. And, uh, and so uh, it's very, very interesting. So I go through all of these contrasting value systems between China and the U.S., both focused on the same thing, how to control markets and greed and ego and bring back the balance to the golden rule, Confucianism, um, you know, uh, where we have to accept that we are one. We are one on this planet. And, uh, and so we've got two competing consciousness uh, groups, you know, I mean, mostly now in the U.S., which the U.S., they own the media. And that's why you're getting more and more about this uh, conflict between China and the U.S. Um, it it's, uh, it it's doesn't have to be. Exactly. And, and so uh, I, I've gotten responses from many of my Wall Street friends who manage billions of dollars. And one of them came back, and I quoted him in my article. He manages a couple of billion. Uh, and um, he said, well, look, we are cooperating with China on um, emissions uh, for climate change going, going to uh, the COP26. We are cooperating. We cooperated with China at the UN in 2015, when we both agreed and every other com country member agreed to the sustainable development goals, which is the reemergence of the golden rule. Mm -hmm. It's a holistic view of the fact that we are one. 
all of us, just one species. I mean, but the DNA says the same thing. You know, <laughs> can't deny it. We we all actually have some Neanderthal genes. It, yeah, all there are a lot of people that would not like to hear that. They would like to hear that. Well, they wouldn't like to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> let's have let's have a little humility. Um, let's understand how powerful our consciousness is, and how, in a flash, we can change it. And of course, my friend Bruce Lipton, you know this wonderful book that we are talking about today. Um, my friend Bruce Lipton, I remember reading his book, The Biology of Belief. Mm-hmm. where he points out that the state of our consciousness and our belief can actually change the cells in our bodies. I mean, you know, I, uh, I, that's still one of my favorite books. But um, so it's all doable. And, and so what we need and what I try to do with my chapter in this wonderful book, The Dawn of an Era of Well-Being, um, is to lay out, there's something futurists do. We call it scenario building. And uh, so I just laid out the scenario um, of how we could actually have a harmonious society um, in, in harmony with each other and in harmony with all the other species on which we rely on this planet. And so what we need now, I think, are more of these kind of uh, visionary scenarios. See, it, it's very easy uh, as our social media companies, you know, that we're talking about Facebook, but that's only one of them. Um, they make money by getting us angry and upset and fearful. That's how they make their money. And what we need um, is the uh, is the uplifting, inspiring, and soothing images, you know, where we can take a deep breath and say, "My gosh, um, what's wrong with a different scenario?" And, and the thing that really is fun for me, because I have never called myself an economist. Many call me an anti-economist. Um, I, I am really a futurist. And a scenario building now, uh, where you look at all of the alternative possibilities based on our levels of consciousness. Are we going to do business as usual and go down the drain? Or are we going to muddle through? Um, or are we going to adopt... Um, uh, a scenario which we know is achievable um, if we uh, accept that we are one. We are one species. And so uh, so that's what my life has been about. <laughs> so there's such value in what your life is about, what your life is about, Fred. And I think what you're both also saying is that this this inherent value of recognizing that we're one it needs almost to be branded in a way that's more appealing because I do think, and I'm not sure if you would agree, but maybe this is our last uh, point to, to address. The idea that we are one can also be very threatening to people because they're afraid of losing their individuality, their identity. We know how married we are to our individual identity. So can you both, uh, if you will, ease the, the conscience on the part of a lot of people that as much as they may want to feel that they're a part of and that they're one, are also afraid of that a little bit and what that implies. Can, can you both just... Um, I would just uh, love to jump in and, and say that really in the United States, this hyper-individualism um, <laughs> has served the, um, the um, billionaire class the, uh, for 50 years, we have all of these oligarchs in the U.S. who control our politics by giving money to politicians. And they also control the economics profession. They funded the University of Chicago and Milton Friedman and all of the other think tanks and university courses. And the basic message was individualism good, collective action bad. 
like labor unions or getting together to build a non-profit hospital or whatever, like bad. And then the other thing was that markets good, government bad. Mm. And that uh, has been, um, we've been brainwashed, including all our politicians, have been brainwashed by economists who claim to be scientists, you see. They even have a phony Nobel Prize. I mean, the Nobel Prize in economics is a fraud. Uh, it's actually called the Bank of Sweden Prize. The money was put up by the Bank of Sweden. <laughs> you know? In memory of Alfred Nobel, and I have worked for many years with his descendant, Peter Nobel, who is a lawyer, and, and he says that this is, you know, intellectual property theft, that his uh, gra great-grandfather knew economics could never be a science. It's an ideology, and uh, it's okay. It's a profession just like law, you know. And um, the, their their ideology basically is hire me and I'll justify whatever you want me to do using uh, strange mathematical formulas that nobody can understand and telling you that it's pure economic science, whatever it is you want to do. And so it's a fraud. It's an intellectual fraud, and um, it has brainwashed a whole generation. And, this, you know, particularly where I live down here in the southern United States, um, that was all exacerbated after the Civil War. Uh, oh, no, because it couldn't be about slavery. Uh, oh, because we were really good to the slaves and all of that. It was these terrible government people from the north who came and invaded us and trashed us, you see. And so here in the South, that played into the anti-vaxxer movement. Oh, no, you know, my body, you know, and I'm against the government. I can't have the government, even though if they've been to public school, they've had hundreds of vaccinations. You can't get into public. Even in the state of Mississippi, it requires... Uh, the students to have vaccinations every year for, you know, for flu and a whooping cough and measles, you know. And, and so uh, we have to uh, either re-educate a whole generation of Americans that hyper-individualism will be our, we'll commit suicide if we keep on with this hyper-individualism and not recognizing that we are part, uh, we're always part of a community and uh, I don't know, what What do you think, Fred? Am I new friend? <laughs> <laughs> Our new well, friend. Uh, let, me, let me try to take a tack from consciousness. Consciousness is one. But when in the material world, duality happens. And that's separation, that comes to fear. But when the duality happens to our sensory system and receptors, we develop a sensory-based consciousness of reality, which is a separation reality. The more we become more separated, more individualistic, the more we become more materialistic, because that's how the materialistic world, and the more we become fearful and more separated and more divided and more conflicted. Hmm. And so, as we can see, it's consistent with the development of the trend from the initial religious-based Enlightenment, we try to reclaim some power all the way to extreme materialism and extreme consumerism and extreme individualism. This duality and separation by itself created fear because the fear comes from separation. Mm -hmm. We have two basic motivation of emotions, love and fear. Mm -hmm. Find holistic or separation. And the ignorance of that we are separated create more fear. And we got holding on to the identity. And yet this identity enslaved us. And we continue to hold on to say that that is us. And I can find freedom of my desire. And yet we are more and more and more. And so we're the, as you said, it's going to blow up. And so we become hollowed up because we're so far from our truth. Mm -hmm. that we found the reality of materialism real at all. And yet we hold on to this ID identity, which deepened up the separation, which increased further the fear. 
So now they said we're one. Oh my God. This fabricated idea, fictitious self is so afraid to die because I don't exist. I'm not real. We're not separation. We're one. Of course, very fearful. But yet, consciousness is a very real thing. We have to understand how consciousness created five bodies in our body. The physical body is just the outer layer. And that consciousness expressed through, through our soul, which is connected to the net, connected to the, the whole consciousness net. Then our energetic body, then our mental body, then our emotional body. Then there's an expression of physical body, which expresses itself in DNA and neural wiring. But we only look at the physical body. We don't understand how the physical, emotional, mental, energetic, soul body works and how it's linked up to the, the consciousness net. Because we don't know how sophisticated this system works. We have the wrong system to analyze from the outer body. But the founding core is our soul, which is connected to the, to the net, the whole consciousness field. And so if we gradually awaken at least what we are, and answer the existential question. That may be the beginning of awakening. So this fear of well-being cannot happen without also major human awakening. Mm-hmm. And it takes that 2,500 years after the Exo era, the massive awakening era of the second Exo era, a born of a new civilization, the end of the Mayan calendar, a new energy of change aquinas, Speeding up and lighting up energy of Earth, and that's the human on Earth, and just an awaken to. So I'm very hopeful. Fred Hazel, bravo to both of you. I, I feel today that we have already demonstrated just how similar we all are in our individuality, but as part of something global, cosmic conscious and whole, very whole. Here's to filling that gaping hole in our global hole with soul. And I want to thank you both so much for, once again, a very compelling conversation today. Uh, I'm Alison Goldman with our hosts, Irvin Laszlo and Fred Sow, and today's special guest, Hazel Henderson, inviting you to join us for more episodes of Dawn of an Era of Well-Being. Read the book, buy the book, wherever books are sold. Feel the book, feel the words, and remember, when building a new paradigm for humankind, let's try to include human kindness. Stay tuned and stay attuned. And now for the second portion of our program, an interview with Irvin Laszlo and Hazel Henderson. So, good morning, uh, dear Irvin, and it's always an honor to be able to talk to you. And as we start this conversation this morning, I just want to remind us that it's in the broader context of this wonderful new book that uh, is coming out now, and uh, it's the dawning. uh, Do you have the actual title, Nora, or the, the, the title page you could put up? Um, and anyway, the point is that, that I'm very honored to have a chapter in it where I do what futurists do, uh, which is create scenarios. And uh, we generally have business as usual scenarios, which are kind of did society muddle through all of its issues? Um, we have a, a, a really a dystopian scenario um, about how things fell apart. And then we have a, a positive scenario. And yes, the dawn, the dawn of an era of well-being. And so that is uh, what I tried to do in the chapter of this book. 
the dawn, dawn of an era of well-being. Uh, I tried to um, context it in the fundamental understanding that Irvin has been teaching us for decades, that we humans are one species among many, many other species we are all totally interdependent on this planet Earth, which is a third from our mother star, the sun. And we are totally reliant on the daily free photon shower from the sun and the very first technology that uh, this planet invented by plants as we know, photosynthesis, where they learned how to take those free photons and within their leaves, turn them into carbohydrates, which are the basis of our food supply and the food of all other species uh, in the whole uh, biosphere, and that we are all living forms totally dependent on the sun, and interdependent with each other. And so um, I try to uh, take that as the, the, circ- the circumstances of our reality today and how that means that we have to raise our consciousness to this new mature level of understanding um, the, the conditions of our survival. And that means uh, that the planet now is sort of teaching us directly. And it's saying, hey, humans, you're up to graduation time now. Either you extend and, uh, and get your consciousness to this higher level of understanding, um, you're not going to be a fit species even for this planet you may just join the sixth extinction. And if you succeed um, in raising your level of consciousness of this total oneness that um, is interdependent life on this planet, uh, then, of course, you may go on at some point, you know, to be an interplanetary species, but you're certainly not fit yet. You have to first tell us that uh, you can live um, uh, as a responsible species on this planet. (laughs) So what I tried to do in in my chapter is create a scenario uh, looking back from the year 2050 uh, and to see how we humans got together, learned our lessons, and achieved the level of maturity to make ourselves fit. Um, to continue on this planet, um, this wonderful journey. And Irvin has been describing this journey to higher levels of consciousness and has been one of my mentors all of my life. Hello, Irvin, and thank you, my dear. Hello. You are wonderful and you are very kind. I would like to be... I would like you to be my mentor because you know so much and so concretely you have changed, helped to change the mindset to heighten our consciousness, raise our consciousness. I have some very concrete issues that I like to bring up and discuss with you now that I have you here. We're just these days we are living through the G20 meeting, we are living through the COP26, we are seeing, living through all these discussions that go on, which indicate that we are not mature yet to live on this planet. We are destroying the planet. And unless we change, we will destroy it in such a way that hum- humankind, which is nearly 8 billion people, will not be able to survive. This is the last lesson. It is a dramatic situation. If we don't change, practically, we are doomed. The question is, can we change? How do we change? How do we raise our consciousness? How do we become more mature to live on this planet? You talk about 2050. If we don't change, we won't even reach 2050 as a, as, as a human species. The situation is dramatic, is serious. 
And finally, we are waking up, waking up in time. How can we do this? What are the forces, the elements that can make people sit up, become more aware, become more responsible, become more conscious? And what elements in society can contribute to this? You are at home in the area of, of, of business, of markets, of the whole world, of, of the universe of business on this earth. Do you think, how can you believe or what can you tell us about business and the whole market sphere on earth becoming an agent of raising our consciousness, becoming more aware of our interdependence, of the necessity to grow up in order to be able to live on this earth? It seems to me that business, especially big business, at least on the surface, it seems to me is not so much concerned with our global well-being, it's concerned with its own interests. Mm -hmm. But well-being used to be the main main keynote for the main key element for, for creating businesses and operating businesses. This used to be still in the case 100 years ago <clears throat> when the great captains of industry, Dale Carnegie and, and Henry Ford, and, and um, Andrew Mellon and others were talking about the business as really as a social benefactor. They wanted to create a, a, something that promotes society. These days, and at least not with, ex with exceptions, of course, but many business leaders, especially big business, are more interested in winning than in benefacting others. Competing and winning has replaced this idea of, of really working for the common good. Now, you have created already major changes in the way markets operate. Can you tell us something? Can you give us a sign of hope, reason for optimism about how business can become a powerful force in creating a human man mindset which enables us to live, to survive, and eventually to thrive in this world? Well, your conditions, what, what you have described is absolutely scientifically correct. That we have less than 10 years now, we humans, to uh, elevate our consciousness to the level of uh, understanding our own uh, narcissism, our own greed, our own egotism, um, our own uh, consumer cultures. And I just came away from the meeting, uh, an annual meeting of uh, my uh, fellow members of the Club of Rome. And um, there is the same discussion going on among all the members of the Club of Rome. And there's a lot of um, despair. Um, and there is also um, a lot of uh, discussion of, okay, we have no right to despair. Um, we must continue to do the very best we can with this next nine years. And so um, I just hearken back to the last decade, the um, conference uh, on climate held in Copenhagen in 2009. If you remember, that was a train wreck that was kind of saved by President Obama. Um, and he barged in on the Chinese and the Russians and demanded a seat at their discussion. And um, we've just put up a video um, of President Obama's role for the ever since uh, that 2009 conference in Copenhagen. And what we did at Ethical Markets Media, we produced the first of our green transition scoreboards. And this has been an annual effort to track all of the ethical green private investors, actually people like me, <laughs> um, who've been taking risks um, and uh, investing in what we in the markets call pure plays, uh, solar energy companies, wind companies, uh, companies doing LED lighting, uh, energy efficiency, all of those things. And that first uh, time in Copenhagen, we found 1.1 trillion U.S. dollars already invested 
in these green technologies. And while the government agents from all of those countries were arguing with each other and naming and blaming and shaming each other about who was responsible, you know, there was the tier one countries that did all the polluting and the tier two countries who were now, uh, without having uh, caused the problem, were dealing with the effects, including climate change, um, in such a way that they were experiencing floods already and climate change, the small islands and all of that. So every year since 2009, we have continued to communicate, uh, uh, to track communicate uh, uh, the, cumulatively the, uh, those private investments every year. And the model we used mentally was that if we could find at least a, a trillion U.S. dollars uh, going into these same green technologies and green companies every year until the year 2020, um, we might have enough investment in the pipeline to um, enter what we call the solar age. If you remember, I wrote a book in 1981 called The Politics of the Solar Age, and it was based on my six years' experience prior to that as a cabinet-level science advisor in Washington. And I saw up close uh, the power of the fossil fuel lobby the power of the nuclear power lobby. Um, and at the same time, all these little business plans were landing on my desk, you know, for solar um, cells, for wind generators, and all of these future technologies, you know, uh, electric cars, you name it. And so, uh, so basically, um, uh, this last report that we just brought out of the Green Transition Scoreboard um, is a cumulative 10.3 trillion U.S. dollars um, is now in the pipeline working toward the renewable energy uh, societies that we must have in the next 10 years, not now almost nine years. So um, what we've seen, uh, we were kind of discounted. Um, we're very small. We don't have any sponsors. Um, I fund this with the um, royalties from my books and TV shows. <laughs> so, so we're very small players. Um, and yet, in the last year, since the COVID uh, virus and the now we see climate change in the fires, the floods, the storms, um, sea level rise, suddenly everything has changed. And uh, we remember from our biological understanding that stress has always been evolution's tool. And uh, without getting some kind of a kick in the pants, uh, no species has evolved. And so suddenly, um, we humans have had this terrific kick in the pants um, from both COVID and climate change disasters all over the world. Can't deny them. See them on TV. And so this last year, uh, suddenly... Um, everybody comes to us and says, okay, what's, what's the very best thing, the very lowest fruit we should do to capitalize on these nine years? And, um, a, um, a very high level, uh, official, uh, came to me about three months ago and said, um, I remember your work when you were a science advisor. There were very few women science advisors back then. And he said, uh, I now have a direct line to President Biden's new science advisor, um, Dr. Eric Lander, who is uh, um, of the Broad Institute between Harvard and MIT. And he said, I want you to tell me uh, what is your highest priority for me to put on the top of Dr. Lander's desk? Because he's now a member of the cabinet. And I said, okay, um, what we've been pushing for the last two years 
um, is related to the perilous food supply, food system, where uh, all of our food, um, we can look at how um, undernourished we are, actually, because the food supply um, is monocultured, depleted grains that are traded on commodity, global commodity markets for money, rather than caring about whether they're good nutrition. So uh, this this global food system is what we call a massive market failure. And the reason that it's so perilous right now is that it's all resting on the planet's 3% of fresh water. And yet this is the water planet. And there's no shortage of water. And the other half of the plant kingdom is salt-loving, nutritious plants, which are still grown as they were for centuries in 22 countries around the world without fertilizers, without pesticides. They grow on unused land, um, often uh, degraded land, even beaches and um, uh, salinated land. And basically they have all the proteins, complete proteins that humans need, and they have the exact mineral profile because, of course, they're, they, they're grown on salt water, and their only input is the photons from the sun. And so some of these, are, are we, we call them halophytes, um, and that, of course, means salt-loving. Some of them have hit the supermarkets, like you're familiar with quinoa, the grain, that you can get in any supermarket now, a perfect food. And then there's amaranth, uh, that that's now available around the world. Uh, and then uh, the Chinese have salt-loving rice, which is very delicious and has a high market value. Um, there are many other um, of these salt-loving plants, like sea asparagus, which grows all over the world um, in brackish uh, coastal waters. And no greedy capitalist can can corner the market on it because it grows everywhere and so on and so forth. And so um, I got together um, with um, one of our very deep colleagues, and he is the, the NASA chief scientist on their Earth System Science programs at uh, Langley in Virginia. And he turned out to, to totally agree with me that the very lowest hanging fruit um, was to rapidly invest in these salt-loving plants, bringing them to market. So we did a television program together, um, which is playing right now on our homepage, and it's called Investing in Saltwater Agriculture, the next big thing. And there's all the pictures of these different plants and um, all the nutritious uh, gourmet dishes that you can create and you can find in restaurants all over the world. And so we have been promoting halophytes. You can find all this information on, we have a page now called halophytes. So I got back to my friend um, who knows the science advisor to Biden and said, okay, uh, it's number one is halophytes. Let's expand the food supply um, and uh, to use these very nutritious plants. And of course, who's against this? The fertilizer companies, the pesticide companies, the companies like Archer Daniels Midland and all these trading companies who trade the monoculture grains, the five monoculture grains that have very little food value but make tons of money. Uh, then there's the tractor companies and uh, the, the uh, people now in the digital sector who are saying, oh, well, let's apply artificial intelligence to growing food. All this kind of nonsense, you know, they don't know anything about it. And so we got together a couple of years ago with uh, and made a coalition with all of the new companies. There's about 150 of them 
um, that um, are enjoying double-digit growth um, in plant-based foods and plant-based beverages like oatly and, you know, uh, soy milk and almond milk and all of this new stuff and um, impossible burgers. And, you know, you've seen them all. They're all reaching the supermarkets now. And they are achieving double-digit growth all over the planet. And they're being invested in, we found, by a group in London that we work with now called FAIRR, that you can click through uh, from our website. And they are an, a, an international investment consortium of animal rights lovers, vegans, and vegetarians. And guess what? They have over 20 trillion U.S. dollars that are going into expanding the plant-based uh, transition away from meat and away from pasturing agriculture, you know, cows and all of that, which we know um, the cattle, um, which, you know, they go into the rainforest in, in Brazil and cut down the trees in order to run the cattle. Um, and this produces 15% of the greenhouse gases that we're trying to reduce, and it takes 50% of our current agricultural land and fresh water to grow the feed for these cattle, you know, the alfalfa and all the rest of it. And so many of the, um, the of this 150 companies now who are uh, rapidly expanding are getting into cell-based meats where you take the cell of a cow and grow it in a petri dish. And the same thing is happening with fish. Um, and then there's a whole new sector now based on uh, insects. Two billion people on this planet um, uh, enjoy I insects. And um, at least now um, they are being produced commercially for um, pet food. But we know that that's a huge um, expansion that we can do. So the point is that the goal is um, no more animal or animal-based meats or fish-based meats. We save the animals and we save the fish and only use their cells to grow a much, much smaller percentage of human food. Now, all of that is in motion with an enormous amount of money behind it that we never expected to find. And basically, uh, it's now um, got to the point where we think that this shift actually could bend the uh, CO2, the ambient CO2, uh, downward within the nine years, because not only are these halophyte foods and um, plant-based um, companies now um, providing all of this nutritious new food supply, but their long roots uh, capture ambient CO2 and return it where it belongs to enriching, re-enriching our soils. So it's like a win, 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 win. And so if you want to watch um, the presentation of our uh, friend uh, who is the NASA chief scientist, just click on our home page and watch him and me talking about this for 27 minutes with lots of pictures. <laughs> and so I introduced him to the science advisor for Biden because I don't need to be involved and much better that they should listen to a NASA chief scientist telling them this than me telling them this. So um, we are always looking, Irvin, for those unexplored niches in the system uh, that have been overlooked or they have been concealed by lobbying and campaign contributions um, and um, media disinformation. 
such as we've had from the fossil fuel industry, like the tobacco industry before them. And all these fossil fuel executives went on um, the Congress last week and had to admit that they knew that fossil fuels were going to create this climate disaster. They knew it in-house. They didn't tell the public. They hired all these public relations people and all these psychologists who weaponized um, our powers of persuasion uh, and put them at the service of marketing and money. And so, you see, the thing is, there's nothing wrong with markets and money. They're two tools that humans have created and used for centuries, as um, uh, has, uh, Karl Polanyi pointed out in his wonderful book, Ancient and Modern Economies, back in the 1960s. And he talks about all of those Polynesian islanders for thousands of years have um, paddled their canoes between islands and exchange goods that had relative value within their different cultures than the money that they used were shells. And so we love marketing and communicating with each other. We love exchanging. And uh, indigenous people all over North America have exchanged feathers and uh, all kinds of uh, items, wampum, so there's nothing wrong with money or markets when they're local and face-to-face -face or always driven by people um, based on their value system. But uh, what happened when the Industrial Revolution began was that uh, it was very easy to take money and uh, weaponize it and, using math, turn it into a single metric and that's what happened. And we ended up where all our statistics were based on the price system and from GDP all the way down. And the price system, of course, as you know, is a function of human ignorance because it's always historic, backing into the future, looking through the rearview mirror. And it allows, because our accountants allow what they call externalities, like a Freudian slip that says that anything, um, any bad impact that I create on innocent third parties, um, we'll just forget about that and we'll externalize them from our balance sheet and pass the costs and the impacts on to society or hide them in the environment. So um, that's basically we've been trying to retrain asset managers um, who right now are all terrified. They're saying, oh, the green economy now is going too fast. You must slow it down because we have all these stranded assets on our books, you know, and that we're valuing all this um, fossil reserves in the ground that cannot be lifted uh, and burned without cooking the planet. And so, oh my God, we have to write them off. You see, and, and so this is the battle that's going on in COP26. And there are enough green investors, I know many of them, who are there at COP26. Uh, Tom Steyer, um, who ran for president, is one of these really big green investors, and many, many, many others, um, and a lot of mayors, um, including Bloomberg uh, from New York, and, um, and also Mark Carney, the former head of the Bank of England, and he's written a wonderful book called Values, and he agrees with me I could have written that book myself. You know, um, that we cannot go on using the price system as our only metric. We have to pull back, take a wide shot, look at the periodic table, look at the science. And, you know, when I was at Calvert for 20 years trying to um, look at the company's uh, performance, whether they were bad on pollution or manufacturing weapons and all of those things, we did that 
um, and we did affect a lot of uh, change in the financial markets. But it was necessary, but no longer sufficient. We cannot now look at a big area like biodiversity and try to cram it into the price system. No way. It has its own value scientifically. So our last report is called Transitioning to Science-Based Investing. And as we're doing that, um, Calvert and I did that. We produced the first alternative to GDP in uh, the year 2000. We released 12 indicators, 12 aspects of quality of life, and less than half of them were conducted in money. Like we had urban air pollution. You wouldn't use money. You would use the science. How many parts per million of junk in the air? And so um, nobody took any notice of the Calvert-Henderson quality of life indicators. But it turns out now that these, in, these kinds of indicators um, with the same kind of view that we had of going beyond money. And now, um, you know, there's the gross national happiness indicators from Bhutan. And, uh, and so we humans are maturing and there's a lot of scientific basis for helping this along in this next nine years. So I'm sorry for that great long discussion, but uh, I still have hope that humans, our fellow, dear fellow humans, are not terminally stupid. What do you think, Irvin? Well, here's a, this gives you a lot of food for thought. I have hope, but my hope is based a little bit differently from yours not on investment, on money, but on the capacity of human beings to perceive who they are and who, how, what kind of a part of a world, what kind of a world it is that in, in which we all live. We need a thorough change of the value system, of the mindset, of the perception. Otherwise, we will keep having opposition we have the good guys and the bad guys. You also mentioned your side, all the good investors and all the people are op opposing the, them. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need the support of a critical mass of humanity to be able to face this challenge. You call it nine years or 2050 or whatever timeline we give. We are heading toward a breakup. We are heading toward a, 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 a tipping point after which it could be, could be very difficult to try and turn back. And we need to join together. We cannot have competition on who does best, things best and on uses this or that means. We need to join together with the single basic objective in mind. We have to ensure the survival, the persistence, and then hopefully also the evolution and the thriving of people on this planet. This is not assured at the present time. At the present time, our extinction seems to be assured, but it's not. What we can do and what we need to do is to create the value system, the mindset, the perceptions that it shows that only together, only by the way of nature, and which you can show through science, of course, but also by intuitively as primitive single indigenous people have shown also that way. Join nature, connect again with, with the womb in, from which we have emerged. We have gone past it, perfectly far away. We have created an artificial system based on money, based on competition. And that has to move back to a co co cooperative system based on shared value. We have nine years, you say. All right. I think we may, we may have the tipping point reached even in a few years, even in the next, next few years. Who knows if we already reached it? I don't think so, but it is very close. So we need a mindset change. We need a tidal change of perception in this world. 
then all the advantages, all the science, all the possibilities of food and resources could be realized. It's not that we don't have the resources. We do, as you show. Mm -hmm. We do. We could live and thrive on this world. Why don't we do it? Because you're using antiquated lenses on that puts us first and nothing else comes next. Finally, I think we have a chance for better politics in the U.S. and in the world, in, in, in many parts of the world. To use it, we need to get people to wake up, to learn what you have to tell them, what you have been telling me and telling, telling here, which is absolutely crucial, but to, to wake up in such a way that they can use it, not for the immediate selfish interest, but feeling being part of that whole being part of the humanity, which is now threatened. We are threatened with extinction. If we can recognize this, then we'll make use of what you are telling us. Then if you won't have to fight it, then you will be the, the great prophet, which you already are, but you'll be recognized as such on, on, on the earth. So there we are at the critical point. We have hope. We have possibilities. We need to have that minimal wisdom that enables us to live and thrive on this planet. Yes, I thank you very much for this brilliant expo expose of our possibilities, of what you are doing, what you need to continue to do for our common good. You are one of the greatest possible benefactors of this age of change, age of, of danger, of threat, or threat, but age of possibility as well. Thank you again, and I look forward to our ongoing discussions. Thank you so much, Irvin. And of course, you're absolutely right. And we have to now realize that uh, following nature's principles um, is simply the only way forward. And there are children, um, Greta Thunberg talking at the UN, and the millions of children who follow her now realize that this is really very simple stuff. And that if we follow nature's principles and we follow the oldest uh, parts of our society going back thousands of years to the golden rule. And that was an acceptance, the first acceptance of this total mutuality. Uh, do as you would be done by. It was Confucius and uh, Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad. I mean, you go to Wikipedia, there's 50 pages on the golden rule. And we have to remember that the money-based societies are much smaller and still embedded in each country's much larger unpaid volunteer, what I call the love economy. That's still there, but it hasn't fully been recognized. And as we recognize that that is the key to our future, I think we can learn your lessons. I fully agree. Love, econo love economy and the sharing economy and the natural way forward. I think these are the key points. We have hope. We have a chance. Let's get together. Let's discuss it, but act it. Let's be the change that we want to see in the world. You are already the change. And you. I, I, I try to make the change. Let's do it together. Thank you, Lisa, once again. Thank you so much, Irvin. Much love. Much love to you. Thank you for joining us. Dawn of an Era of Well-Being is a co-production of the Laszlo Institute, ITEA Institute, and Select Books. It's produced by Nora Cesar and Kenichi Sugihara with theme music Chimera by Biba DuPont. The book, Dawn of an Era of Well-Being, co-authored by Irvin Laszlo and Frederick Sahl, is available wherever books or e-books are sold. Please subscribe to Dawn of an Era of Well-Being, the podcast, on Apple or Spotify for more fascinating guests and discussion. My name is Allison Goldwyn, founder and creative director of Synchronistory.com, a future party for the planet broadcast live worldwide. Wishing you well-being till we talk again next week.